Welcome to another edition of the Mark Jackson Show. We're on the Come and Talk to Me Network. I'm Mark Jackson. This is my dynamic co-host, my guy, Blue. We have a legendary guest, but first, let's pay some bills, Blue. I got you. I got you, Pops. Shout out to Underdog Fantasy. Go ahead and click the link in the description and use the promo code MARK. That's M-A-R-K. And they are matching a first-time deposit of up to $250. We appreciate y'all. Now, now, Pops, back to you, man. It's, a, it's an exciting day. So, so you better do this introduction right, man. It's a lot of pressure on you. Do it right, Pops. Well, there's some folks that need no introduction. This guy is absolute royalty. When you talk about the greatest announcers in the history of sports, not just basketball, but sports in general, this guy is the host, the host of Mount Rushmore. He's a former uh, colleague of mine. I work with him. I'm forever indebted because as a young kid, seven years old, I dreamt of being Earl of Pearl Monroe watching the Knicks. At the same time, I dreamt of being the late great head coach, Red Holzman. And, I, and, I, and at the same time, I dreamt of being an announcer. I fell in love at seven years old with this guy, the legend, Bob Albert. Nice, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm, I have watched some of your shows, particularly enjoy the one with <laughs> Reggie Miller, which was a, uh, was that a six-part series? Oh, two-part series. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I must say, and my brother Al, who did the Indiana Pacers when you were there, and of course Reggie was there, uh, he said what it reminded him, because you guys were off the wall, what it reminded him of was after games, after Pacer games, uh, he'd be on the, the team bus and, and this would be going to the airport. Uh, and uh, you and Reggie just were going at each other, just arguing about crazy stuff. You know, you would just throw something out and it'd be an argument. It did not matter. Uh, Blue, this is rather embarrassing because <laughs> I'll pull some of the subjects that they were... Uh, debating about but for the rest of the team it was like post-game entertainment that's what it was and that's what i saw the other day when you and reggie were going at it it's great well that that that's exactly how our bus rides and our plane rides were and all the time so since you watched it can you solve the 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 the, the, the question who has bigger ears me or reggie <laughs> <laughs> i'm not getting into that one no. <laughs> You're looking great, man. Is that a Brooklyn Dodger hat? Yes, it's my roots. Back to my days uh, rooting for the for the Dodgers, the Dodgers of uh, Duke Snyder and Jackie Robinson and uh, Pee Wee Reese and Carl Erskine. Actually, I, I, when I was a kid, I worked for them as an office boy, which was like the greatest thrill to be able to do that. And uh, I, it gave me an opportunity in terms of broadcasting, because we were right, we were in the booth right next to Vince Scully, who was uh, in his younger days uh, doing Dodger games, and he was just so great as he was in his later life. Uh, and after games, I would go into his booth and take the commercials so we could use them at home when we did games off the TV screen on a tape recorder. Uh, my brothers and I would do that. But uh, working for the Dodgers was, was such a kick because I, actually they played for a while at Roosevelt Stadium in New Jersey because O'Malley, Walter O'Malley was going to move the team to Los Angeles. So they were trying to get some more income because they weren't drawing that well at its field. And I was assigned as one of my jobs and they did put me in a car. I had thousands of dollars worth of tickets for the game at Roosevelt Stadium. And they'd, I, they'd say, take the subway. And I'd go subway, Hudson Tubes, and I'd deliver all the tickets to Roosevelt Stadium. But the the best part of it is I would come back on the Dodger bus and I'd end up sitting next to people like Jackie Robinson and Carl Farillo, uh, just the whole, the whole crew. So for a kid who was uh, basically, I'd just gotten out of... I was in high school at the time. What a, what a thrill that was for me. Well, well speaking about uh, your, your beginnings and all these names that you've been around, I just want to know, it's, it's been itching ever since we've started this interview. I need to know. I'm sorry. I, I can't wait. Where did you start your, your catchphrase? Yes, I, I need to know how it started. <laughs> I got to know. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that was that was, don't don't judge me on my impersonation. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do my best, but but you know we got the real real thing here, so I need to know, please. <laughs> well, it actually started. Uh, I can even remember the time it was a game at Madison Square Garden when I was doing the Knicks, and Dick Barnett, who was the backcourt partner of Clyde of Walt Frazier, uh, hit one of his fallback baby jumpers. And it just came out. I said, yes. And it seemed to catch on. Even players were throwing it back at me. That people would tell them <laughs> I was using that. And um, I then incorporated yes and it counts when a guy they drives to the basket and is, is hacked, is fouled, and will go to the foul line. And that came from there was a, a, a very good referee by the name of Sid Borgia. In fact, his son was a official in the NBA and then became uh, part of the uh, refereeing, I guess, amongst the refereeing executives after he retired, Joe Borgia. But uh, his father was a legend because he would have these, uh, make all these motions when he would, it was very animated when he'd make a call uh, on, on the court and he'd go, yes, and it counts. So that's, a, I stole that from him and I, do, I try, not to, try not to overuse it, you know. But when your dad was playing, I remember there were quite a few yes and it counts. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me ask you, when was the first time you dreamt of being a broadcaster? I would say, Mark, from the third grade on, that's what I wanted to do. I, I remember writing a composition, it was an essay for my teacher at PS 195 in, uh, in Manhattan Beach. And uh, I said I wanted to be either a broadcaster of Knicks and Rangers and NFL or a columnist for the New York Times. The Times thing did not work out. But uh, <laughs> my, my brothers and I would lug around a woolen sack or Revere tape recorder, and we would bring it downstairs to uh, the living room, turn down the sound on the TV of the actual announcer, and uh, we had a crowd record. And like Al or Steve would switch off playing the crowd record, and uh, I would do the game, and we then we rotate. And uh, that, that's when I knew I wanted to be a sportscaster. And, uh, you know, it's very fortunate the way things did, did work out. Uh, even uh, when I was working for the Dodgers, and we bring the recorder uh, to that booth that was right next to where the Dodgers were broadcasting, we had one problem. There were many of uh, Walter O'Malley, who was the president of the team, many of his friends were sitting. It was like a suite at Ebbets Field. And they did not take it well when we got too enthusiastic about uh, how we were calling the game. And I remember being called into the office of Fresco Thompson, who was the general manager, and he was a really nice guy. So he put it to us as nicely as possible that Mr. O'Malley does not want you in this booth anymore. And they put us all the way down the right field line. So uh, the, the view wasn't as good, but still that was great, great experience doing it. One, one thing for me is I, I, I don't take for granted dreaming as a seven-year-old kid to be Earl Pearl Monroe and then having his phone number in my phone I can text or call him anytime I want. Talk to me about your influence, the late, great Marty Glickman, going from an influence to a friend of yours, a close friend of yours. Yeah, Marty was uh, really instrumental in helping me get going in what I wanted to do. He was a Syracuse man, as I, I, I was a Syracuse guy. And I ended up working for Marty on, you may remember this, the high school game of the week which was on, I believe, Channel 9 in New York. <laughs> and I did all the uh, research for it. Marty did the games, and he, he traveled around to different high schools, and it was, it was quite popular at the time. Uh, so he was a great influence in, in terms of uh, my broadcasting. Marty was one of the all-time greats in terms of doing Giants football. He did Knicks basketball. Uh, he did... Uh, well, all kinds of sports on, on television and was recognized as one of the great basketball announcers of all time. He really set the geography of the court. Of the court. It was 
right corner, left corner. He's driving across the lane. He's driving straight down the lane. I just, he pointed out there were differences in the way you had to describe what was taking place. And uh, Marty eventually worked for WCBS, and he asked me to uh, come with him, come along with him at CBS. And he was doing a daily sports show, and then the Knicks and the Rangers were on WCBS. And uh, he talked the general manager into giving me a show on high school sports. And that was, that was a major break. And then Marty had to miss a Nick game. And I was just out of college. And he was in Paris doing some business for harness racing. He also called uh, the harness races at Yonkers Raceway. And I was maybe 19, 21, 22 years old. And he had to miss a game up in Boston. So that was my first game at a very early age. And I did several Nick games and Ranger games uh, that year. That would be like 1964, 65. Uh, and that, that's what really was my first big break. But Marty always would have suggestions. You know, he'd listen to the games, listen to tapes, and it was extremely helpful to me you know, throughout my career. And uh, yeah, we became great friends. Uh, in, uh, I would say, you know, when, when I when I matured a bit, so uh, <laughs> yeah, he was always there for me, which is unbelievable. Well, speaking of people who were always there and and stuck with people through maturing, I know that you worked with my dad early in his career with the Nets with broadcasting. Can you just give us some stories or maybe some 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 er yeah yeah some early stories from from uh, those times, it, it, it was a joy to work with uh, with your dad. It really, it really was. We had so many laughs. Uh, I enjoyed watching Mark argue about everything on the bus that we would take when we were with him. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of baseball arguments, as I recall, mm -hmm. uh, with producers and technicians, and he, he would just look to have an argument. <laughs> in your younger days, was there a lot of activity in the argument department? Not not serious argument, though. You talking about me or him? I was talking to Blue. Yeah. Oh, you you said you said were there were there were there a lot of arguments <laughs> at the house? Oh, oh, one thousand percent. I thought you were saying yeah. it was in the past. I was waiting for you to finish talking and say it, it continues to this day. It's <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 1,000%. This dude will talk, argue between an iPhone 14 and an iPhone 15. Which one was better? <laughs> <laughs> but on a, on a serious note, Mark, I thought was terrific on the air. I had heard you when you did some games for ESPN, and I, I, I didn't think you were used correctly. And I had to talk you in to taking the job with the Nets. I don't know if you recall that. Because it was a combination of a player's point of view a coach mentality, humor in the broadcasts. Uh, we, we really had a fun time. It was, it was just great. And it was so, it was terrific to see you at uh, ESPN. I, I mean, I, the whole crew with Mike and uh, with Mark and uh, Jeff Van Gundy. So, uh, and, and Jeff, incident, I have a, a story involving, I hate to bring his name up, but uh, Mike Fratello, Lazar, <laughs> who is someone who should not really be walking the streets. You know, he should, be, he should stay indoors. But uh, when I had recommended Jeff to uh, to the people at TNT, and he, I was working at the time with Mike. This was where, after he was with the Hawks and I think the Cavaliers. You know, and. Uh, he would hide, you know, we'd be in the green room getting ready for our games at TNT. And Jeff might walk into the hall just to get his thoughts together for the open. And uh, the czar would take Jeff's sport jacket and hide it. Just, you know, minutes before we're going to go out to the court. Jeff went crazy, you know. He, he would do this every, every so often. And... Uh, 
it was, uh, it, it, and we laughed about it afterwards, but uh, we play all kinds of pranks on each other. So, uh, Not only did you have the moment where Michael Jordan was in a zone and gave the shrug as he knocked down three-pointers, but the Lakers versus Bulls moment in Chicago, Michael hangs in air and switches hands, finishing on the opposite side. Talk about that. That's one of the all-time moves, as far as I'm concerned, at least in my days of doing the the NBA. Uh, just to see him propel himself and make that switch from one hand to the next. Uh, it, the crowd went crazy. Uh, we, we couldn't believe what we saw. I mean, there's so many incredible Jordan moves. And it's these days with... Uh, the guys just making even more fantastic moves. You see things that are close to that, but not what Michael did that that particular game. Uh, but the game has changed so much. I mean, it's it's so as you know, Mark. I mean, it's it's so different than what we saw even in the '90s because of the three-point shot, uh, because of the athleticism, because of the the training, the staffs that teams have. Uh, it really has changed to a great degree. By the way, you also had the flu game, Marv. You, you've done a lot. You've had yes, the flu game. Flu game yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, it was amazing to see every time. We, we had a heads up from Ahmad Rashad that Michael wasn't feeling well. Ahmad was doing the sideline reporting. And uh, he opened up okay, and then you could see he was being worn down. And every time out, he would be held up as he walked back to the bench, back to the uh, uh, huddle. In fact, he didn't even stand up for the huddles. Uh, every time he walked back, he was prompted up by Scotty Pippen and others. But mostly Scotty had to keep him on his feet. And then he had, he had a tremendous game, as I recall. But, yeah, that was one of the most memorable uh, moments, I'm sure, in Michael's career, even though I'd like to forget about not feeling well that day. Do you think he milked it, though? I mean, being carried all the way to the back? <laughs> you, <think he> was... <laughs> you know, we were pretty close to the action. I think there was a question as to actually what happened to him. Was it something he ate? You know, that still has never will never be solved. Or was it the flu? Uh, but uh, I don't... I don't think it was in that case. I, I think he really was feeling uh, pretty awful. So, so I'm listening to both of you talk about unbelievable stories that you've seen over the years, Mar. I know that my father has broadcasting stories as well. Visually, somebody may think that I'm the odd man out, but Mar, me and you actually have a job in common that my dad has never had. And that is being a New York Knicks ball boy. Can you speak oh, a little bit about those days? Because I've experienced it too, and those are those are glorious days. My pops has no clue about. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I actually, when I was in high school, uh, I did I, I did get the job because I I got to know the Nick publicity people from being at so many games, and uh, I did get the job. And just sitting on the bench was such a thrill. Well, at first, I was visiting ball boy, which was eye-opening because I would try to stay in the locker room at the garden when it was visiting teams or coaches I wanted to hear. Red Alback, who became a friend in later years, kicked me out immediately. <laughs> he did not want anybody listening to what he was saying to his team. So that I never I never heard the cell stuff what they would do at halftime, but there were several teams I was able to stay uh, in the locker room. There was one situation which I'm sure I would think you never share, Blue, is that Wilt Chamberlain. Uh, I don't recall it wasn't it was before his Philly days. He, he, I, I might have been when he was on the West Coast, but. Uh, he, he called me over. He's sitting on, on one of the benches in the locker room. And he said, kid, would, would you, I couldn't believe this. This is right at the start of the halftime. Would you, he gave me like, no, he didn't give me any money. Actually, he said, would you go to the, 
would you go to the concession stand and get me four hot dogs? <laughs> <laughs> and I did. You know, I stood online for a couple of minutes, and I did. And, no, I never got the money back. Uh, <laughs> I got to know Wilt a little later in my broadcasting days, and he actually was a very funny guy. I mean, he had a, a great sense of humor. Uh, I never mentioned that to him, but uh, yeah, that, that was one of the more memorable ball boy uh, situations. One other, the Knicks uh, were sharing the garden with so many other events and were not what they have turned out to be. And uh, they were playing at the 69th Regiment Armory, which I believe is still in existence downtown in New York City. Mm -hmm. And it, it was really, uh, the, the seats were not comfortable seats for the spectators. I think the capacity was about 8,000. But it didn't matter because the Knicks were not drawing what they have in recent years. But I remember going into the Syracuse Nationals uh, locker room and Dolph Shays is at the urinal, and a couple of fans just walked in, and they also went to the urinal right next to Dolph. I mean, they just walked into the locker room. It was crazy. Uh, so that that would be a memorable, a memorable moment uh, for me too. Also, you you go from calling you you go from being a ball boy for the New York Knicks for all of those years to in 1970, announcing 54 years later, we remember it, New Yorkers remember it, when you're yelling, here comes Willis, as Willis Reed limps out of the locker room through the tunnel. Talk about that moment. Yeah, that was, Mark, that was the loudest crowd I've ever heard until last year's Nick crowds, I thought were really uh, at a high level. Uh, Willis, I did the pregame show with Willis, you know, a couple of hours before the game. And that's where he he got a shot, which is, you know, he, you know, he admitted for his knee injury. And he said to me on on the show, he was going to play no matter what. He had sat out the previous game. And uh, there were not many hopes. The series was tied at three with the Lakers. There weren't many hopes that Willis was going to play. In fact, both teams went out, warmed up. And there's no Willis, and you can hear the buzz in the crowd. Then, with three minutes and 27 seconds remaining before the buzzer that gets the players off the uh, court, Willis comes from underneath where our broadcast booth was and limps out out of the court. And I said, "Here comes Willis," and the crowd is going going nuts. As he then takes a couple of warm-up shots hits them and the crowd again reacts to that and uh, ends up playing. Maybe hit two baskets, hit, I guess two field goals in the first quarter. And uh, that was it. You know, he was just there, had got some rebounds and all, you know, but uh, just his presence did inspire them. But it was Clyde who had the incredible game. I think it's 36 points, double figures in uh, – assists, and he had about eight, nine rebounds. Uh, he, he was incredible, just sensational. Uh, but that team was so special. Uh, DeBusher and Bradley, you know, at the forwards, Willis usually the center, and uh, the guards were Frazier and, and Barnett. Red Holzman, the coach, he had Mike Reardon coming off the bench as the give a foul. The rules were a little different at the time. Uh, he had Dave Stallworth. He had... Uh, uh, Bill Hoskin, I recall, played briefly in that game. Donnie May. Uh, but the starting five plus uh, Stallworth coming off the bench, that, that was just a tremendous team. I remember they won the first five games of the season, regular season, then went 23-1 and one, uh, after the first uh, five wins. Uh, and I it was, I got a kick at a Nick game uh, this past year. I sat with Bill, Bill Bradley, was up uh, in the same area we were, in the suite. And uh, we were talking about his days at Oxford. And said he would go 
they had a basketball court there, and uh, he would do the play-by-play. He, he would shoot around, do the play-by-play to himself. I said, can you give me a little uh, sample of what you sounded like, how you, how you called it? He said he would, but it would break your heart. <laughs> talking, talking about announcing, you also announced NFL football with the great Bill Parcells and the great Paul McGuire and a sideline reporter by the name of O.J. Simpson. Correct. Yes. I believe you got a great Paul McGuire, O.J. Simpson story for us. Well, O.J. would be down on the field during the time we were rehearsing our open for the broadcast. This was at NBC. And uh, Paul and I would go through the rehearsal, and then O.J. would do the pregame show and would use the same information that Paul had and said on the air. <laughs> Paul had nothing for the open. So what he started to do and what we started to do was basically throw the open. We did a fake, a fake open. Now, OJ, I know, did use something that was wrong at one point that we did on purpose. Uh, and then he caught on that we were just making up stuff. <laughs> Paul, was so, Paul was so bad. Paul and OJ were uh, teammates with the Buffalo Bills. Paul was a punter and a linebacker and was a very funny person also. He was great. Uh, and then went on, not only he went on to the top, uh, for being the number one, number, on the number one team for NBC and then went to ESPN, also did the number one game. Uh, there's another OJ story that I'll never forget, and I think people who are at the Garden will never forget. We were doing the NBA playoffs where the Knicks were going up against Houston, and uh, all of a sudden we see uh, the writers at that time were courtside, and they'd had uh, TV monitors there, and people were coming down from the stands to watch the monitor. And we were told by Dick Ebersole, who's the president of NBC Sports, that we had a cut to uh, Tom Brokaw, who was going to give the details on the OJ chicks. And this was going on during the game. And Tom Brokaw and I were going back and forth. And uh, it, it was the most unusual telecast you could ever think about. With the chase going on, we're doing a game in the NBA Finals, and OJ is uh, being pursued. It was, it was, can't make this stuff up, uh, but it was during our, our uh, finals game. So wow. it, was, it was a crazy time, just crazy. That's unbelievable. Yeah. I, uh, I wanted to ask you, over, over so many years, such a such an amazing Hall of Fame career, what would you say was your um, your biggest difficult difficult time as far as broadcasting, or your most difficult time? That's a excellent question. Uh, you never said that to me, Marv. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. Uh, the most difficult time was doing in, in my, these are my early years, doing a college game at Yankee Stadium. I don't even remember the teams. And I didn't feel I knew the players well enough. Usually, I, I'm one who really enjoys doing the research and the preparation. It's one of the things, if anything, I miss is that, along with the people I work with. But... Uh, I, I was uh, really lost for a little while. It was, it was not a national game, but still, you, you know, I felt terrible after that because some of, the, some of the players did not have numbers on their uniform. It was a small college game, and uh, it was impossible. So that probably, I, felt, I just felt so awful after that. After that game, which never again happened, you know, but normally you would not do that type of game. I shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Uh, I did go to the practice. I did not know they were not going to wear 
numbers, and they, I think both coaches played, you know, 45 to 50 guys. So it was, it was, we had to kind of fake it a while. Uh, you, you know, you hate doing that. It, it felt, yeah. I felt I wasn't prepared, but I don't know how you prepare for that. Well, I know where you didn't have to fake it and you knew every name. That's in 92 when you had the privilege of covering the dream team. Talk about that experience. Yeah, that was one of the uh, – in would be on the other side of the uh, of the scale. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was uh, – that's an excellent question, Mark. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that was a thrill. I mean, to me, though, that was the greatest group of athletes in the history of sports in, in one ensemble. And uh, there were so many things about that. It was, you know, it was Charles Barkley walking and followed by hundreds and hundreds of people as he walked, you know, uh, through Barcelona. Uh, it, it was, the games were blowouts except for one uh, where they went, went up against Tony Kukoc. Uh, and the reason was that Jordan and Pippen would double team Kuko just before he signed with the Bulls. And uh, Chicago players were so upset that Jerry Krause, who was the general manager of the Bulls, was going to give, well, particularly Scotty Pippen was upset, was going to give Kuko more than Pippen. And of course, Scotty, uh, you know, felt it was absurd. It probably was at the time, although Kuko was a, was a, a uh, very good player too, so they double teamed him, and Tony was not able to get much going. Uh, although the game was, was probably the best game of the tournament of the Olympics, because uh, Croatia was a good team. But uh, that's one memory. Uh, just seeing the earlier games where the U.S. team for the practice games would go up against. For example, the French team, we were, we were in uh, Monaco at the time where they, where they were training, where the uh, United States team was training. And before the game, all these players were looking to pose for pictures with the NBA superstars, particularly Michael, who was very kind about it. You know, he put his arm around the guy and he'd take a photo. And then in the game, these guys end up pushing and shoving each other, and they're going <laughs> crazy. It was really there were hard feelings for some reason, probably because it, the game was a blowout. And then after the game again, they took more photos, and the U.S. team was cooperative. And <laughs> they were okay with it. They're shaking hands, uh, and, and you know, giving each other a tap, but. Uh, that's one of the memories I had prior to the Olympics. And it was nice to be in Monaco, too, I must say. But uh, otherwise, the games were blowouts. It was still a thrill. They'd be calling the games. Uh, I remember, again, a situation with, uh, if you pardon the expression, Mike Fratello, who was with me <laughs> as the color commentator. And a ball ended up being deflected out of play and to our area, and Mike grabs it and puts it between his legs because he wants to steal it, basically. <laughs> Take it with him back to the hotel. And a, and a couple of uh, policemen came over and said, no, oh, sir, you have to put that back, you know. And he was, he felt embarrassed and should have been, you know. But uh, yeah, he did flip it back. <laughs> If that, unfortunately, that's a memory I have of uh, one of the memories of the Olympics. But that was that was a just a great uh, tournament to do from the United States point of view, and it led to all the international players who are so good that we see now in the NBA. Uh, it's it's really something to see how the sport has grown on an international level and will continue to. Well, who wins? Who wins in, in, if prime versus prime, the 92 dream team or this year's Olympic team? Well, if it were a seven game series, I mean, one game you can't make a judgment on. Um, I, I, it's so different because, because it is a three point 
contest, but if all things were equal, were 92 people playing now and would be able to have those skills, I think they'd win. Uh, perhaps they'd win even without those skills. Uh, but that would be a heck of a matchup. But I, I uh, maybe I had, I'm a little prejudiced about it, but I, I, I think that the 92 team was, and, and Larry Bird was injured. I mean, if he were healthy, it, it would even have made a, a greater impact. Uh, but I, 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 I look at that as the greatest team ever. We'll see what happens with the present uh, NBA gear team that'll be in the uh, in the Olympics in in France. I I think I agree with you, Dad. I'm, I'm curious of your thoughts. Who do you think wins? Prime versus prime. I got to go with the '92 Dream Team. I believe they're the greatest team ever assembled. I agree. I agree. Yep. I'm with you. But but, but we can't go off. You're, emph- you're emphatic about it. Yeah, that's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh... Yeah, they were so deep when you think about it. I know the U.S. team is still looking to find its way. Uh, and they had a couple of close games. But I, I can see that happening. Uh, the 92 team, I know Chuck Daly, who was the head coach, was, was happy about it. But they were beaten with the doors closed. No one no one saw it. There were a couple, I guess there were a couple writers that did. But uh, it was it was not to be seen. But the college team, led by Bobby Hurley and others, uh, did win a game against the uh, the U.S. '92 team. But I think Chuck liked it because he felt he could then scream at his players and say, "Hey, look, these guys beat you. You you, you can't show up like that," because they may not have taken it that seriously. Uh, and it's the same thing I think when. It, I mean, Germany is a good team these days. I mean, so they gave the United States a run. But how about South Sudan? And they're going to be very good. I mean, I know Lou Aldang is the guy who is, uh, I guess, the uh, he's running the team. And Royal Ivy is the coach. Yes. Uh, and, I mean, they have some NBA players on the team. And they're very young. And it's great to see. I think they've only been in existence for, what, eight years, eight, nine years? So we're going to see even more from South Sudan. Now, you even called uh, some boxing with Doc, the great Dr. Ferdy Pacheco. I mean, in Seoul, Korea. I mean, you, you, you've done it all, Ma. <laughs> well, that was at NBC. They went into boxing in a big way. We did a, we were fortunate to do a, a number of, of uh, major fights with... Uh, Marvin Hagler involved, and uh, Larry Holmes, uh, a whole batch of people. I did a a Ray Leonard fight, uh, and it it was a great throw. We were all over the world, too. We would do fights in France, in Spain, (coughs) several in Italy. So it was quite quite an experience. Uh, I remember one time we were in... I won't name the country, but uh, there was somebody from NBC who would actually carry cash with him. We had to pay our way to get out of the country. <laughs> I do remember that. I won't mention the country. But uh, yeah, we, we ended up staying there an extra day and a half, which was not, not a thrill. And they would not, until they uh, were able to agree on the sum of money, we were not allowed <laughs> out of the country. Uh, but Ferdy uh, was great to work with. Uh, he was the uh, uh, official doctor for Muhammad Ali. And as I once said on a Letterman show, he was not the type of doctor that you would recommend to have at your family's bedside. Uh, <laughs> I know Ferdy got mad at that, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, he was uh, he was really good on the air. We we did the uh, Olympics in uh, Korea, also in, in Seoul, South Korea, and uh, that was an experience because there was so many crooked things going on. And Wally Matthews was our 
a sideline reporter, and Wally was right on it, and he, I thought he was going to get thrown out of the arena a couple of times. It was the Chung Chil Children's Arena, it was called. It was a huge, uh, a huge building. But the problem was there were fights going on at two different locations in the same building. <laughs> the one we were doing for NBC and one maybe uh, 50 yards away, the <laughs> bell would go off <laughs> in the one 50 yards away and the one where we were, the fighters would stop. And one, one guy almost got knocked out by that. You know, <laughs> And uh, there was a bad decision with Roy Jones that uh, he should have should have won his fight. Although he, uh, as a consolation, they made him the uh, uh, the boxer of the Olympics. The, yeah, the Olympics. that doesn't count. No, it doesn't. No, he was pretty upset, and it, it was clear that he won the fight, as we had mentioned on on the air. But uh, that was uh, that was really a lot of fun. Uh, and Seoul turned out to be a really nice place to be. So. Now, you, you, you went to the great Lincoln High School and some tremendous all-time great basketball players and legendary folks came out of there. I did my research. I don't know if you knew him at the time, but you're the same age. Do you remember Neil Diamond going to school with you at the same time? Yes. He, uh, uh, it was... Uh, he went to Lincoln for two years, and I think he transferred to Lafayette because his family, his family moved. But you mentioned the athletes. We had Lee Mazzilli, former Met Yankee, former manager. Uh, Basketball-wise, uh, Stefan Marbury was there. Not, not when I was there. A little after. <laughs> uh, and uh, there were several others too. Uh, there was a pitcher who was also before your time, by the name of Saul Rockman, it was a relief pitcher for the Chicago White Sox. It's funny how these the names come back. And, you know, sometimes if I can't, I try to think of somebody's name, and I realize when I was nine years old, I could tell you the entire starting lineup for the Philadelphia Phillies. They were very good at the time. In fact, they played the Yankees in 1950 in the World Series. I could tell it if you'd like to hear it now. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Winkus at first. Uh, the shortstop was Granny Hamner. Uh, the third baseman was Willie Puttenhead Jones. Uh, the outfield was Richie Ashburn in center. I don't know if any of these names click, Mark, with you. I remember Richie Ashburn. Yeah. And, and then he went on to uh, do the Philly games for a number of years on, on TV and radio. A guy named Del Ennis, who was a very good player was in left, the right fielder was Dick Sisler. Uh, Mike Goliath was the second baseman, and the pitchers were Kurt Simmons and uh, Jim Constanti, who was the MVP that year, was a relief pitcher, was, was, and Robin Roberts, who was a Hall of Famer. That's all I know. Now that's impressive. Yeah. I don't even remember my backcourt partner with the Pacers. I think it was Re some big head guy. I don't know his name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> I must say, <clears throat> Blue, Mark was an excellent interview as a player. I remember uh, during the playoffs, <clears throat> I'm sure that it's a memory that you wanted to forget. But I did sit down with you, and uh, you were very, very good and funny, too. Well, thank you. That was good. Uh, I, I had an uncle, and we, sh we talked about this when we worked together. I, you can <laughs> But my uncle was a big time New York City handball player. You talked about you had legendary handball experience also. Am I right? <laughs> Not as a player, no. <laughs> but you remember those remember those great battles yeah. in New York Brighton City. Beach, Brighton Beach Baths was a handball haven, I remember. I don't know if you know. Uh, and they had there was a champion, he was Customato's, he worked for Customato who was uh, Mike Tyson's. Absolutely. Uh, the Catskills, the great custom model. Right, right. Uh, last name was Jacobs. He, he was a champion high school, uh, champion handball player. Mm. Jimmy, Jimmy Jacobs, who eventually ended up uh, owning all the 
Tyson footage. Wow. His partners with someone, and they sold it for a lot of money to ABC. That's my fact for the day. <laughs> <laughs> this is your first appearance on the Mark Jackson show. Yes. You've had 53 appearances on the David Letterman show. <laughs> oh, more. Oh, no, actually more. More? Yeah. But you see, I counted them. It was a battle between Regis Philbin and me. And he would complain that I counted, uh, like, little bits that I would go on. <laughs> and it's not a guest appearance where you sit at the chair. So with, with that, I was close to Regis, who was over, I guess, was in the 90s. So I was fairly wow. close. Wow, it's impressive. But um, I, I, being the, uh, I, I had the scorecard, so I would count I'd be like a DH, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be there. But Dave, was, it was great to be on with Dave. I mean, he was a big sports fan, still is, uh, but would have these wacky uh, ways of expressing what he thought he saw. So we had a lot of laughs. And he'd go on there, uh, and I would also have bloopers that I would play, the wild and the wacky. And he was a very good audience for that because he was easily laughing at almost everything. So that was it was it was it was fun to do the interviews, with, you know, with Dave. Here's a good question because, and I think you're more qualified than anybody because you've seen the all-time greats and you, you you're watching today. Who is the greatest basketball player that you've ever seen? Michael Jordan. Close, you know. Obviously, LeBron is in the discussion without any question. Uh, but I, I stay with Mike. It's a very, very tight, very tight race between, between the two. I, you I heard just him, must, Mark, I just must say, what we I say Michael LeBron. Jordan, but these young guys. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm not gonna say who's better today, but what we see in LeBron James do right now. With Team USA is 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 unbelievable, and it's Father it's Time amazing. is, yes. yeah, yeah, it's unbelievable, and, and Father yeah. Time is undefeated, but yep. what we see LeBron do is is special, it's special. Yep. So as he's continuing to build on his legacy, I'm just gonna say it's not a closed case; it's it's still open. We'll see who ends up being the best because we're watching the how, dudes still build on it. How much longer do you guys think he's gonna go? I believe he can go another. Playing a facilitating brand of basketball, he can play another five years. Really? Ooh, I, I really believe that. Yeah. Five. Five. It, Mike, <laughs> uh, Mom, it, it's, it's tough watching the all-time greats. Like I still believe that you got a couple of years of yes, and it counts in, in, in you that you just you know don't decide not to do anymore. I believe it's tough for me to say bye to, to goats. So I think that they they have like Tom Brady. I think he can play today and play a couple more years if he, if he wanted to. He might be able to. I, I, I thought he was hurting, though, on that last year, you know, in terms of uh, he admitted that, you know, he was not 100%. But you feel like he could rejuvenate. He's in, he stays in terrific shape. You, you feel he could still play. Absolutely. No, 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 he's selfish. He just wants to see the greatest athletes <laughs> run themselves into the ground. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anybody else in the NBA you think could go a long, particularly long time? I mean, the, I think the game, to me, it feels guys are getting injured more than they did in the past and are sitting out more. Uh, I, I, and those injuries, as you know, linger. I, I, I don't know. Is there anybody else you think could, could last into their 40s? I think because of the way the game is played, the three-point shooting, I can certainly see Steph Curry being able to play an extended period of time. He stays fresh. I think the injuries early on in his career was a blessing in disguise. It saved some of the, you know, the, the mileage on his body. So I can see him playing, you know, further on until, until this type of age. Yeah. I thought that originally, before, I thought Clay at one time, but of course we've seen him get injured the last couple of years. You you trigger me to ask more questions, Ma, because you got the Brooklyn Dodgers hat on. So my my last question, I guess, is Willie, Mickey, or the Duke? 
Say that again. I'm sorry. What? Willie, Mickey, or the Duke? Oh, Willie, Mickey, or the Duke? I, I, I would say Willie. I, I'd go with Willie Mays. Say hey, How, kid. How about you? I would. I, I think all three are great. There's no wrong answer, but I have to lean towards Willie. Yeah, and Mickey was injured toward the end of his his career. That that set him back. Duke Duke was terrific too, but I, I don't think he's in that the class of, of Willie. I mean, it's a very fine line there. He's not in the class of Willie or Mickey. But those were great. Those were great days. I really want. Fun day to think about, along with the 1950 Phillies. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to our sponsors, Underdog Fantasy. Go ahead and click the link in the description. Go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe as well. And use the promo code MARK, that's M-A-R-K, and they are matching a deposit of up to $250. We appreciate y'all. Thank you so much to the legend, the one and only Marv Albert, for joining us. Doesn't do much, but it's impacted me, and I think it's important to be able to give the ones that have impacted your life the flowers while they still can receive them. The great, the legend, Marv Albert. Thank you so much, man. Salute. Thank Love you. you. Mark Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. Thank you. That's a wrap for this episode of the Mark Jackson Show. I'm Mark Jackson. We're on the Come and Talk to Me Network. Thank you so much for your love and support. Remember, old man once said, preach, and if necessary, use words. A dear friend, filmmaker extraordinaire, Dion Taylor, posted just the other day, don't give your advice, live your advice. People get the message by watching how you live. Now get the step. Blessings. <laughs>